Hello, what's up everyone? It's your boy, the late Lord Haven, back at it again with another Song of Ice and Fire livestream. A Iceberg Theory livestream in particular. Today we're going to be looking through a bunch of cool theories regarding Young Griff. Um, and we'll be working our way through them one by one. Um, yeah, I kind of did this last minute. I've been working hard on my... Uh, upcoming What If video, What If the Blackfire Rebellion Succeeded, fun little animated video I'll be doing. Um, and then I thought, oh, while editing the audio, so I've done the script and fin fully finished the audio, I was like, oh no, um, I need to prepare for my live stream. So I quickly uh, conjured up the iceberg. It's not even fully done, as you can see. It looks like I put Cersei in the wrong camp and I've still got Chad Black Damon Blackfire from the last iceberg because I went over the previous one. Oh well, let's dive into it, shall we? Um, before we begin, before we begin, before we begin, um, oh yeah, that's why I was <laughs> 10 minutes late. Come on, other, other live streamers are later than me. Some people schedule it for like, I don't know, a certain time and then half an hour later they rock up. I don't think it's that weird. Anyway, um, before we begin, like this video, that helps. Um, I'll be checking the chat, of course, but if you want to grab my attention, if you want me to answer any questions or read anything out or propose any theories, as always, send in a nice super chat because that helps support the channel, because this is ultimately my job, and it enables me to keep doing this for a living and making more animated content. Um, but if not, again, like and subscribe if you want to support me that way. And as always, I'll shield the Patreon. I've got an awesome Patreon. Go check it out. I've got, like... 11 people subscribe to my Patreon for free. I don't know why, because I don't produce free content on it, but they just subscribe to it. It's like, okay, thanks for the support. <laughs> why not? <coughs> okay, um, how are we doing? Oh, we got some people jumping in. Awesome. Uh, bef oh, let me, yes, let me just make my, uh, my, my Discord aware. My Patreon Discord, get in the stream. Um, and I guess on Twitter as well, why not? Fully prepared. Also, while I go through each of these theories, I'll be, uh, as as usual, posting polls in the chat. So you can vote on whether you agree with the theory or not. Because I've just realised people like polls. People seem to really like polls. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Uh... Live stream has started. Jump in. There we go. Beautiful. Good stuff. Okay, shall we begin? Shall I start faffing about? Um. Just checking the chat. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Still recovering, so sorry about the cough. First off, we'll start with the most controversial theory of all time. Young Griff is a Targaryen. So this is at the very top. This is above the iceberg. This is fl floating in the clouds. Because this is what's presented to us up front by John Connington and so on. That Young Griff is a Targaryen. Now, first off, before I automatically go, probably not, that's too obvious... That's not as interesting as the other options, blah, blah, blah. Let's ignore it. Let's actually dive into this for a second. So what's the evidence in favor of this beyond just the fact that it's stated as a fact in the narrative? So first off, baby Aegon, if he was swapped, we know that the mountain smashed his head against a wall and he was unrecognizable. And that's kind of convenient, isn't it? That there's this uh, whole plot and his head gets smashed against the wall, he's not recognisable. Maybe the mountain was working for Varys. Maybe when the sack was going through, uh, Varys knew it was going to collapse, the, the Targaryen, Targaryen regime would be overthrown, so he went, okay, swap the babies, bribe the mountain, I need you to um, destroy the head of Aegon, and kill Elia, who, um, Elia Martell, of course, would know the babies were swapped, right? She would know her baby. Um, kill her so she can't tell anyone about the swap. Convenient. Or maybe the mountain killed them naturally and Varys came in and fucked up the baby a bit more uh, to render it unrecognisable and no one would question it because they just say, oh, the mountain did that. 
Um, so yeah. And another thing during Varus's speech to Kevin Lannister during the epilogue, um, he he seems to be implying that Aegon. He, I don't think he outright says that Aegon is Aegon Targaryen, right? He just sort of implies it, and Kevin's like, "Oh, it can't be. I saw his body." And then Varus doesn't really confirm or deny, but it's like, why not just outright tell the truth, right? Because he's literally he's basically apologizing for Kevin. He's giving a kind of a villain speech, but he's apologizing, saying, "Yeah, you're a good guy. Sorry, I've got to kill you." It's because I want um, Aegon on the throne. But, like, why? there's no point in lying to a man who's about to die. Like, what, why not just be like, oh, no, it's not really the son of Rhaegar. It's a, it's a black file, but, you know, oh, well, rest in peace. Well, the reason is, meta-wise, is because it's not that, you know, it's, it's not that... It's not time for the reader to, to find out about it. It's not that point of the story yet. But if we're looking at in-universe reasons... Why would he not, you know, outright tell Kevin, oh, he's a, he's a blackfire or whatever? Why would he sort of dance around the subject? Well, maybe because he is actually a Targaryen. Maybe he's like, yeah. Varys is like, yeah, he's genuinely a Targ. Why not? Um, so those, those are the two reasons. They're kind of weak, let's be honest. Um, you know, Aegon's head being smashed by the mountain, it, it's more likely that that happened. And then, re- and then retroactively Varys said, okay, I, could, I can spin this. I can make up a baby swap story. Um, and in with regards to Varys talking to Kevin again, I think he's being kind of vague about Young Griff's identity because it's for the benefit of the reader. Really, that that final speech to Kevin is arguably the benefit of the reader. Um, it's a cool ending, though. <clears throat> Thought Pycelle was with them. Pycelle's in the room, but he's dead. He's like he's like dead. His head is lying on the table. He's described as having, like, chunks of skull, um, like, islands floating in pools of blood or something. That implies he got, like, smacked in the head. Um, Yeah, so we'll move on to the next one, which is more likely Young Griff is a Blackfire. I almost feel like I don't need to go through this one because we've gone through it so so often. It's, it's, you know, it's the whole point of my last video. But just to go through it again, because, no, to be fair, I didn't go, I didn't, I didn't talk about Young Griff being a, a black fire from a um, meta textual narrat- uh, perspective, right? I-, I talked about it in universe, but there are other there are other hints given to the reader. Um, so, for example, um, so beyond the stuff we already know about, like got why would the Golden Company serve a Targaryen? Illyrio talking about um, Maelys and Monstrous was the last of the male line, which implies there are survivors of the female line, and the whole Ser- Sarah Mopatis being. Sarah Blackfire, um, Young Griff being Illyrio's son, blah blah blah. I'm sort of tying the theory of Young Griff being Illyrio's son with him being a Blackfire. I guess they could be separate theories in, in theory, but I'm tying them together. But going beyond that, what else do we have? We have a little piece of foreshadowing, um, a, a, a fun little hint where there's an inn. Is it meant to be the inn of the crossroads? I can't remember. But there's an inn that used to be called the Clanking Dragon. Uh, the Clanking Dragon, sorry, because there was a um, there was a, a dragon, uh, like a black dragon, uh, signpost, right? That would like sway and clank, and people called it the Clanking Dragon. But during the Blackfire Rebellion, of course, a black dragon is a very politically uh, politically charged uh, image. So it was torn down and thrown in the river, and apparently it later washed up covered in rust right so it's like a black dragon thrown away and returns red which makes you think of maybe this is a young griff foreshadowing a black dragon a black fire they're all they all go into exile they finally return but they're they're in a coat of red paint young griff pretending to be a targaryen when he's actually a black fire <coughs> so that's a little meta thing there but there's also some prophetic stuff i never talked about so for example if my voice sounds like it's dying, it's because I'm desperately trying not to cough, by the way. Um, so, for example, in the House of the Undying, which I didn't talk about in my video. Oh, it's, 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 sorry. Excuse <coughs> 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 me. Um, in House of the Undying, uh, Daenerys is called the Slayer of Lies. Maybe that lie is meant to be young Griff, and she's going to kill young Griff. Um... And she sees an image of a cloth dragon swaying on poles. Kind of makes you think of like a Chinese dragon or something during a ceremony. It's sort of cloth dragon 
held up on poles with cheering, a cheering audience. Maybe that re- uh, represents young Griff. He's a fake dragon. He's not a real Targaryen. Although he will arrive and everyone will celebrate him and wave him around and cheer. But he will not truly be a Targaryen. And likewise, there's a uh, there's another bit where Quaith, the mysterious masked uh, Quaith, tells Daenerys to beware the mummer's dragon. And again, people see that this is a reference to a um, to a pretender of some sort, like young Griff. He could be the mummer's dragon because he's a fake dragon, and a mummer is an actor, right? Like he's a he's a fake Targaryen, or because he's literally. A, a dragon dancing on the strings of a mama, that mama being Varys, so he's like Varys's dragon. Um, so I think, personally, I think it makes sense that he's a, a Blackfire. Some people say... <coughs> some people say that that's too obvious, but again, it's it's as obvious as um, Jon Snow being... Rhaegar's son. It's obvious because it's been so long and we've looked over the theories and stuff. When I first read the books... And no point did I think to myself, oh, Aegon Targaryen must be a secret Blackfire. I didn't think I fully grasped what the Blackfires were at that point. So, um, like, if I'd, if I'd finished Dance and moved straight on to Winds and then the reveal happened, I would be like, oh, that's it. Oh, that's awesome. Like, I wouldn't have come up with that myself, I don't think. Um, but I think we can... <coughs> no, we won't do a poll yet, actually. We can do a four-way poll because we need to go into the... yeah. The other two theories are uh, uh, about the same thing. So, moving on from Young Griff to the tip of the iceberg. Ooh, so these theories are slightly more out there. And here we have uh, Arian, Bright Flame, drinking wildfire to death. So, next up, Young Griff is a piss water prince. So the idea behind this one is fairly simple. It's the idea that Young Griff is literally just a nobody, right? He's not a Targaryen, but he's not a he's not Blackfire. He's not Illyrio's son. He's not you know. He is basically just a random nobody, probably a a Lyseni man, right? Because the Lyseni people have purple eyes, um, silvery gold blonde hair because they've got the Valyrian genes. So could just be a random Lyseni person who's pushed forward, you know, like uh, Perkin Warbeck during the War of the Roses and um, people claim, ah, this guy's a Targaryen. and I, 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 personally, I say no to this one as well, just because I don't think it's as interesting as the Blackfire one. Like, there's so much depth and history regarding the Blackfires and the Blackfire rebellions. I think it honestly would be super exciting if we had Daenerys Targaryen versus a Blackfire. Um, even if it's not revealed, just the idea that it could be in the background is really, uh, really interesting. But him just being a random person, it's like, okay, I guess he could be, but yeah. Like, it's just not... It's not as resonant, you know? It's just not as cool. Um, but then we move on to the next one, which is slightly more exciting, but it's so obscure that there's no way it's going to be this. But Young Griff is a bright flame. So, let's delve into this. <coughs> so, what's the idea behind this one? King Makar I had four children. One of those children was Prince Arian the Monstrous also known as the Bright Prince or Aryan Bright Flame. Uh, he was a sadistic psychopath, basically, one of, the, one of the crazy targs. And he ended up dying because he drank wildfire. And he seeded as early as the first book, right? Or the second book, maybe? Where he wanted to turn himself into a dragon, right? All these Targaryens obsessed with prophecy and obsessed with hatching dragon eggs. Maybe Summerhall was Aegon V trying to hatch a dragon and he accidentally burned down Summerhall. Um, maybe... Blood Raven was obsessed with prophecy, and maybe Ares was as well. Ares the first, maybe Rhaegar was obsessed with prophecy. Well, we know he was. Likewise, maybe Arion is one of these prophecy obsessed Targaryens who's like, "Oh no, no I'm not going to hatch a dragon egg. I am a dragon," and so he drank wildfire and fucking died. But he left behind a son, who he sort of he mockingly called Magor. Uh, named after Magor the Cruel is kind of like a fuck you to everyone, I guess. Like, yeah, I'm going to name my son Magor, you know. It would be like a German politician naming their son Adolf and being like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Just as a troll, you know. Um, and then a great council was called after the death of um, Prince Makar. Uh, the contestants were Princess Vela, who was the simple-minded young daughter of uh, Makar's eldest son, Dayron the Drunken, and 
no one wanted to vote for him uh, because uh, no one wanted to vote for her because they were like, well, we don't want a woman on the throne, let alone a child. Um, Makar's third son, Aemon Targaryen, but he was uh, training to be a maester of the Citadel. He was like, no, 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 no. I took an oath. I'm not going to be on... I'm not going to take the Iron Throne. And so he was skipped over. Uh, that was Makar's fourth son, Aegon Targaryen, who had grown up with uh, Sir Duncan the Tall and had squired for him and had um, interacted with small folk and peasants and all that stuff. And so people said he was half a peasant himself. They're like, he's a, he's a, he's a weirdo. He wants more rights for peasants. He hasn't... You know, he didn't spend enough of his childhood with nobility. He's, he's a weird one. And so... Those were the three... Sorry, those are three options. There was a fourth option, which was the son of Arion Brightflame, Maegor uh, Targaryen. But, of course, Maegor was just a baby, and people feared he would be insane. So it was kind of a one-two punch, right? It was, okay, so we're going to need, what, like a 16-year regency, which could be chaotic as hell, and beyond that, his father was a nutcase. He could be a nutcase. His name's Maegor, kind of bad omens there, bad vibes. So it was like... Nope, skip over him, and they ended up choosing Aegon, who became Aegon V, Aegon the Unlikely, etc. But, there is a theory. Because we don't know what happened to Maegor Targaryen. We don't know what happened to what people called him Maegor Brightflame after his father, sort of implying that he established his own cadet branch. What happened to him? Because technically, he wasn't technically next in line, right? It's By the, lo by the laws of um, primogeniture, it would have been... Uh, Valor would have been Daron's daughter, but he was the next male in line, and he was skipped over, so you could argue him and any of his descendants would have a better claim. So what happened to him? You know, did he die young? Did he have children? Are there, does he have offspring who have a legitimate claim to the throne? We don't know. Arian Brightflame was, again, seeded in either the first book or the second book. And he's also, you know, he's mentioned, and he appears in the first Duncan Egg book. And the Blackfire Rebellions are not mentioned. So we hear about, don't trust the Mama's Dragon. We hear about, um, it, we know about the visions, about the, the dragon on a cloth dragon on poles and so on. So it seems like, at least by the second book, A Clash of Kings, Gurm was pushing for the idea of a uh, an extra claimant to the throne who may be a liar, who may be a pretender... Uh, who, who would fight against Daenerys in some way. You know, the per Perkin Warbeck character, the pretender, the Pisswater Prince. Um, but then, along comes a storm of swords and suddenly the Blackfyre's name dropped. Along comes the second Duncan Egg novella and suddenly there's a big story about the, a backstory about the Blackfyre's that we were never told in the first story. So it seems like George didn't come up with the Blackfyre's, um, in detail at least, until the third main book and the second... Duncan Egg novella. But he had the idea of a pretender, so then he switched things around, blah blah blah. But some people theorise that the original plan was going to be this pretender would claim to be a bright flame. He would claim to be the um, descendant of Arion bright flame and Maegor bright flame and be like, I am technically next in line, not Daenerys. I'm next in line. Because Daenerys is what? Great granddad? Usurped the throne from my, I don't know, granddad, great granddad. Uh, but then the idea would be he's the Mama's Dragon, so it probably would have been a fake guy. It would have been a Perkin Warbeck figure. It would have been like a probably a, a peasant pretending to be um, the, the ancestor of uh, Aaron Brightflame. And it would have been like Targaryen versus Brightflame, maybe. But then he came up with the Blackfire idea, and that's, admi excuse me, admittedly a bit more entertaining. Sorry. I need some more water. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, I'm struggling to talk. You can tell. You can tell by my voice, can't you? I'm I'm talking a bit like this because I'm trying not to cough. Okay. Um. Now, is Young Griff a bright flame? For me personally, no, he's not a bright flame. It, it, that would be too kind of random and obscure, right? Like, we know there's an area of bright flame. We know he has a son called Magor, but there hasn't been enough uh, seeded in the main books, or really the outside, you know, uh, the, the extended uh, material outside the main books about the Bright Flames, it would be kind of like, hey, you know, this historical character, this guy's descended from him. From him. 
And even and even if he was a bright flame, then he wouldn't be the mama's dragon. He wouldn't be the pretend. He wouldn't be a pretender. He would be like, oh, this guy genuinely might have a better claim than Daenerys. But I don't think that's a direction it's meant to be. I think I think it's likely Blackfire. Bright flame is just kind of a. F- this theory is like a fun nod to what could have been. So I believe originally. There was the idea for a pretender who was claiming to be a bright flame. Yeah, that's a cool idea. At the moment, at the moment, I think it's kind of irrelevant, you know. But I, I am interested to see what George does with Maegor Bright Flame when we read Fire and Blood Part Two, if we read Fire and Blood Part Two. Hopefully, like I wonder what his plans are for him. It's probably gonna be something dumb, like he went abroad and tripped on a brick and died. I don't know. He's not a woman, so he can't be killed off in childbirth. So George is actually gonna be creative about that. Who knows? Um. But we've gone through all of the Young Griff is a X theory, so I think it's time for a poll. And we've done this poll before, but why not? Let's the theory poll's are always fun. Who is Young Griff? And I'll be posting this in the chat. Um, Targaryen, Blackfire, a peasant, or a bright flame. The poll is in the chat. Feel free to go ahead and vote. <coughs> what do we think? It's, it's fun just watching the, the Blackfire one just explode immediately. Like, poof. But um, oh right, I have a super chat. Let me double check that before we move on to the next theory. Um, thank you for the super chat from the one, the only Cole Shot, who says, "What about Young Griff? Is just a puppet prince for some lords who want to claim power and use him so they can gain power and money." Um. I mean, I think to an extent, Young Griff is kind of acting like a puppet, right? So we've said before in previous streams, uh, the the emotional um, human element of the Young Griff storyline is the idea that Illyrio and Varys are connected to him in some way. So with Varys is friends with Illyrio, perhaps Illyrio is Young Griff's father, and then he's like fulfilling a promise to his late wife Sarah Mopatis and that's the sort of you know that's the the the, the deep human connection right uh, that they're not just motivated by money and power but they're fulfilling a promise that they're, they're doing it out of respect all that kind of stuff but people do things for many different reasons uh, Zong of Ice and Fire is full of complex characters with um, multifaceted goals and ambitions and so on so yes i think to an extent Illyrio and varus probably want someone on the throne who they can control to some extent and they can gain power and wealth from it's just that that person on the throne has a personal connection to them because it makes the story a bit more interesting but yeah i, I have no doubt that i have no doubt that Illyrio and varus are going to use him for personal gain right to, to gain some power maybe become landed have some wealth have lots of influence, more influence than before at court, all that kind of stuff. But I know he's kind of um, he's kind of strong-willed. He's hot-headed. I don't think they're going to have much luck if they try to use him as a puppet. I think he's going to. I think Young Griffin. Have a little cough. Um, okay, let's move on. To, oh, okay, let's wrap. No, we'll move on to the next theory. We'll wrap up the poll in a bit. Let's get some more votes in. We have 69 votes. Nice. Let's see if we can get more people in. So, the next string of theories are all going to be about marriage. So, let's take this one by one. So, at the top, we have Young Griff will marry Daenerys. Um, now, no, this isn't going to happen, but... This is the plan. This is originally Illyrio's plan. It's that Young Griff and the Golden Company 
we'll travel to um, we'll go to Volantis and then from Volantis we'll travel to Marine and try and give some assistance to Daenerys during her, her plight, right, her struggles against the Masters and we'll say listen, aunt, you're my aunt come marry me, give me your army you've got Dothraki, you've got Unsullied you've got um, cell swords, uh, and you have three dragons so come with me, we'll marry and we'll claim the throne um, but then young Griff changed his mind because he's like he, in part because he gets influenced by Tyrion, he's like why aren't you just taking matters into your own hand and just invading Westeros right, do that now, just go go and seize Westeros, it's, it's, it's in a place of instability and chaos you're wasting time by going to Daenerys it could be too late and if you want to want to, if you want to marry her take the throne first and then if she comes over then off on a marriage alliance and so then a young griff decides to invade Westeros but I don't think he's going to marry Daenerys right I don't think Daenerys is going to come back and because it would be like it would be too perfect you know young griff marries Daenerys then armies joined together, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's not going to happen. There's going to be conflict between them. There's, it's going to be Daenerys is going to learn that a um, young, handsome lad named Young Griff has seized the Iron Throne and claims to be a head of the line of succession. After everything she's fought for, after everything she's believed, someone who's ahead of her is like, boom, no, the throne is rightfully mine. And not only that, he's going to marry someone else. And she's kind of going to be locked out of... Um, locked out of power in that sense and that might push some sort of conflict blah 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 even before she finds out potentially he's a blackfire or whatever so no I don't think they will marry because there's um, more conflict to be had if he marries someone else uh, who, could that, who could that other person be let's have a look the next option is Ariane Martel which is sort of the next most obvious option to me and I think that would work really well for the story here we've got some Ariane Ariane with a, a blood orange <coughs> There's lots of great Ariana artwork out there. I don't know which one to choose. Okay, so um, at the moment, at least according to the Winds of Winter, uh, Winds of Winter sample chapters, Ariane is currently heading to Storm's End to sort of treat with, with Young Griff, right? Because the Dornish are like, yeah, we want revenge on the Lannisters. We want to avenge Elia Martell and her children. And then they, and um, Doran Martell sends Quentin to try and marry Daenerys and they can form an alliance but suddenly out of nowhere this young griff lad appears this Aegon the Sixth Targaryen and the Golden Company are invading and Durand's like you know what maybe we can ally with him so Arianne is sent to treat with him at Storm's End there's going to be a big battle at Storm's End he's probably going to win it and perhaps they will marry and be the ultimate power couple and we may see um, sort of a King's Landing and the political situation and so on from her perspective, Queen Ariane. And maybe she's, well, you can say that about a lot of these, that they could all be the young, more beautiful queen who will cast down Daenerys because they will be married to young Griff. But yes, Ariane Martel, um, maybe she'll be, maybe she'll be the queen. Because what was it? What was it um, Duran said? Oh yes, because the original plan was for Ariane to marry Prince Viserys. Right, that was Duran's original ambitions. He thought about Ariane marrying Daenerys' brother Viserys. If he ever came back and took the throne, that didn't work out. But you know, he was pushing for his son Quentin to become Prince of Dawn, and Ariane was always upset by that because she was like, "Hold on, up north it's different, but here in Dawn, it's the firstborn, right?" Man or woman, the firstborn inherits. So why are you skipping over me to my younger brother just because he's a man? He's like, no, no, no. Quentin can be Prince of Dawn, but I have bigger ambitions for you. You can be Queen of Westeros, Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, and I think that's what she's going to be. She's going to be, um, she can be. She's going to be the queen. She's going to marry Young Griff. Um, and besides, I, I don't just think it'll be a political alliance. I have a feeling they might get on quite well. She seems to have a soft spot for pretty boys, and uh, yeah. I imagine they're going to hook up, but maybe they won't. If we go further down the iceberg, young Griff will marry Elia Sand. Now, if some of you may be wondering, hold on, which sand is that? There are lots of sands. So Oberyn Martell has, um, is it eight daughters, nine daughters? He has a bunch of, you know, bastard daughters called um, sand snakes, right? 
and the first four, I believe, are with different mothers, that being Obara, Nymeria, Tyene, and Sorella. And then the rest of the Sand Snakes are the children of him and his paramour, El- um, Elaria Sand. So the eldest daughter of the union between um, Obrin and Elaria Sand is Elia Sand. And according, again, Winter Winter Sample Chapter could be rewritten, not technically canon, but Elia Sand is with Ariane Martel, accompanying her to um, Storm's End to meet young Griff. And from what we see, she is very, she's a wild child, right? She's very much an Arya Stark kind of, um, very assertive, uh, she rides horses, uh, she smells of horses a bit, uh, she flirts with Joss Hood, and, um, she kisses a maester's assistant and all that stuff, and Aran is like, oh, please don't ruin things, you're, you're too wild for me. And the idea behind this theory is that maybe she will ruin the Dornish alliance to some extent, well, yeah, by, um, seducing young Griff. Maybe he will fall for her charms. Um, and then that will jeopardise the potential marriage between Ariane and young Griff, or perhaps it's more than just, you know, seduction, maybe young Griff is totally enamoured with her and marries her. So instead of marrying um, the daughter of the Prince of Dawn, he marries um, the bastard uh, daughter of Obrid Martel. And you may think, what's the point of this, right? It, could it be to disrupt the Dornish alliance, cause some conflict between young Griff and Duran Martel, um, cause some conflict in Ariane's chapters. Maybe it's a parallel to Lyanna Stark. As you have Lyanna Stark, who is, again, this wild child, horse-riding, badass teenager, uh, just like um, Elia Sand, and she runs off with Prince Rhaegar, right? So what if a similar Dornish girl runs off with Prince Rhaegar's alleged son? Maybe. Maybe. I'm, I'm tempted to think no. Um, I think she's Elia Sand is being set up to be a nuisance of some sort, to maybe interrupt something, ruin something, jeopardise something. I don't think it'll be stealing young Griff away, because I just think young Griff marrying Ariane is more interesting, you know. And even if he does marry Elia Sand, it's like... I don't know, Duran could just be like, yeah, fine, That's he, she's still she's, she's still my niece we can have an alliance kind of thing. I don't know. Because I think young Griff initially has to be successful, and I think he needs Dawn on his side to be successful, so I kind of think he needs to marry Ariane. I think the the fall from grace will come later, but I do think he initially will take King's Landing and become king, at least temporarily. King Aegon VI. Um, but let's go down, further down the iceberg, and we have... Ma- this is Marjorie Tyrell, for those who don't know. This is um, a candid photo of Natalie Dormer. Uh, young Griff will marry Marjorie. So, what's the evidence behind this? Well, the idea here would be um, maybe Young Griff wants to secure a Tyrell alliance, right? The Tyrells are super powerful, and marrying Marjorie perhaps would bind Highgarden and the Faith and so on to Young Griff. Plus, Marjorie is sort of jumping around the different kings. You know, she's married to Renly then she's married to Joffrey, then she's married to Tommen. It would be kind of funny if she <laughs> she ends up becoming queen again by marrying a fourth king, right? And again, Cersei's paranoid that she's the younger, full, more beautiful queen who will take over. Maybe she literally is, but that might be too obvious. Plus, members of the Golden Company talk about having friends in the Reach, which we'll talk about later, um, but they seem to talk negatively about the Tyrells. They say the Tyrells' power isn't what they believe it to be. And if they, you know, that implies they don't currently have an alliance with the Tyrells, they're probably going to marry a house that is already loyal to them or, or going to be loyal to them or whatever. So I don't think he'll marry Marjorie. I think her story will end a different way. But it's still a fun idea. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, time to end the old poll, shall we? Let's end the old poll. Um, with 112 votes, winning by 78%. You lot believe that Young Griff is, in fact, a Blackfire. Um, and then, all the way back in second place, only 12% say he's a Targaryen. Um, 5% say he's a random peasant, and only 4% say he's a Bright Flame. So, we'll end the poll there, so you can see the results. 
There we go. fit there but it wasn't actually because of my cough it was because I choked on water <laughs> like that was just a natural cough I, I was like oh no I had to unplug there okay um <laughs> Lord Haven of Kufool yeah hope I'm not being too annoying there um so we've gone through four that's the maximum for the poll option so let's do another poll who will young Griff marry and there are more marriage theories by the way coming up we're not done yet we're not done but we'll jump into the others in a bit so will we marry um daenerys ariane martel um elia sam or marjorie tyrell the poll is in the chat feel free to check it out Okay, just checking the chat. <coughs> All right, so uh, John Con has an option. Will Young Griff marry John Con? Hmm, everyone's saying Sansa. Interesting. Shall we go down and see who's next? Young Griff will marry Sansa. That is the next the next one. So the idea behind this is that um I guess it would have to be part of Littlefinger's plan in some way. Uh that he Oh maybe not, maybe she does it of her own own accord. But Sansa, Lady of the North, considering people think Bran and Rickon are dead, um Maybe she will marry, as Lady of the North, she will marry King Aegon and become queen. She'll become Queen Sansa, and it will unite the North and the South. After all the tensions during the War of the Five Kings. Um, and it'll be nice to, to be married to someone who isn't a complete, like, dick, I guess. But this would mean that the plan to betroth Harold Harding will have to go wrong, or he, or he will die, or something will happen. Will she do it independently? Um, will it be Littlefinger's plan? Will he be like, aha, I have an idea. What if you marry? I don't know. Um, but this idea is mostly based off of um, a theory called the Ashford theory. So obviously, first Duncan Egg novella is the turning of Ashford, and there are five champions, right, who are defending Lady Ashford's honour, right? Um, the first is Lionel Brathian. The second is Leo Tyrell. The third is Tybalt Lannister. The fourth is Sir Humphrey Harding. And the fifth is Prince Valar Targaryen, the um, son and heir of Prince Baelor Breakspear. Now, people have noticed that these five champions appear to correlate with um, men Sansa married or was at least betrothed to. So, to start off with, Lionel Baratheon. Initially, Sansa is betrothed to... Joffrey Brathian, but then instead he gets betrothed to Marjorie. Next up, with with that with Marjorie in the picture and Sansa out of the picture, the Ty the Tyrells try to um, covertly marry her off to the heir to High Garden, Willis Tyrell. And so the second champion is Leo Tyrell. Now the third champion, Tybalt Lannister, Sansa goes on to actively marry Tyrion Lannister. Uh, the next champion is Humphrey Harding. Currently, the plan is for uh, Littlefinger's plan is to marry Sansa to Sir Harold Harding, Harry the heir, and the fifth champion is Prince Valar Targaryen. So the idea here is maybe Humphrey dies, uh, maybe Harold Harding dies, blah blah blah. 
but the Targaryen she will have to marry or be betrothed to or planned to marry or whatever will be um, um, young Griff will be Aegon Targaryen so that, that that's a neat little theory I think it's probably just coincidence I don't personally think Sansa's gonna marry young Griff I think her story will take her elsewhere it'll probably take her up north not south but you never know you never know. What do you think in the chat? I'm interested. Um, <laughs> Shanja. Shanja, you must marry young Griff. Shanja, go south. Marry this Aegon Targaryen, Shanja. Trust me. And I will take Harrenhal. Thank you very much. This is my little finger impression. This is my show finger impression. Um, that's a weird Sansa image that's not Sansa that's not Sansa we'll get into the next one yes oh that's a good point Flippy the Mad Mouse in, is in the veil vale looking for Sansa because of Varys yeah because um, there was a price put on finding Sansa, so maybe the Mad Mouse will kidnap Sansa from the Vale and hand her over to Varys, and Varys will hand her over to Young Griff and be like, look, we've got Sansa Stark, now we have the support of the North as well. Maybe, maybe. Oh, I've got a couple of super chats. Um, so before we go on to the next theory, which is Young Griff marrying Shireen Brathian, um, I want to say thank you to Isaac Jacobson for the super chat. He said, Young Griff is hot pie. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I wouldn't say no. I mean, when's the last time we saw Hot Pie? It was, um... Was it A Storm of Swords? Or was it Feast for Crows? It was Feast for Crows, right? Doesn't Brienne meet Hot Pie? Or am I getting mixed up with the show? I'm not sure. But, you know, maybe he, he lost some weight. He uh, got bored, moved to uh, Essos, dyed his hair blue. And people were like, this is a good-looking guy. We can use this guy. We can pretend he's Rhaegar's son. Very interesting. Uh, thank you for the super chat from Coleshot, who says, I don't believe Daenerys is a valid marriage option for Griff, because uh, if he marries her, there will be no struggle. Um, because it's somehow legit, as soon as they get the throne, all is over, no more wars. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. That's kind of what I was saying earlier, um, that if Daenerys and Griff marry, then that's the the breach is sealed, right? Whether he's a Targaryen or Blackfire or a peasant or whatever, if they marry, they unite their armies, they unite their claims, they take the throne. It's too neat. It's too um, smooth. It's 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 almost what you want to happen, but you need conflict. I think um, she's inevitably heading towards conflict with young Griff, and if they just marry, that would be destroyed. So yeah, I agree with you there, Culture. Okay, I'll also, I will also end the poll right now, um, which currently says, who will young Griff marry? The winner by far is Ariane Martel on 63%. Uh, Daenerys is only on 16%. Elia Sand is on 10%. Marjorie is on 11%. So we'll end the poll there. But let's continue talking about uh, marriages. So next up, young Griff will marry Shireen. So Shireen Baratheon, that's who this is. Um... The idea here is that I guess it would be Young Griff securing an alliance with Stannis. You know, maybe Stannis dies and he marries Shireen, or maybe he's like, look, I've taken the throne, you have a claim to the throne, L lend your support, I'll marry your daughter, kind of thing. Stannis would never agree to that, right? Stannis wants to be king himself, I don't think he'd compromise, and the only way Young Griff would marry Shireen is if Stannis were dead, but I think at this point we know that Shireen has to die before Stannis. In some, Stannis will in some way be responsible for Shireen's death, or at least be alive during it. So I just don't. And and plus, their their stories are very much tied up in the North. I can't see them meeting or anything. Um, and it's just not the wisest marriage alliance. Um, but this art artwork is, in fact, I'll show you. It's from a. Uh, it, it it's inspired by a um a fan fiction. Let me get it up called The King Who Cared, which I haven't read. I heard it's quite good. Um, 
I think the premise of the story is essentially that Stannis, Stannis and Young Griff team up. That's basically what the story is. It's what happens if Stannis and Young, Young Griff team up to, you know, fight the Long Night and try and take the Iron Throne and all that stuff. Um, I could honestly, I could do. Yeah, I do my what if videos. I could do a what if video about um, some alternate universe fan fiction. Like I could do this kind of stuff, like the King Who Cared, and kind of do an animated summary. But this is just a really cool piece of art. It's almost too good for fan fiction, right? Um, here we have, I believe this is Horde and Half Maester. Um, we have Jon Snow and Ghost. We have um, Scepter Lamor. We have Sir Rowley. Is that Rowley? No, there we have John Connington here. That's John Con. Um, and then we have Aegon Targaryen himself. That's Rowley Duckfield because he's got the um, the white cloak. We've got Stannis and oh oh, that's Selyse. Why did I zoom in on Selyse's face and not Shireen's face? That's my bad. Um, yeah, I guess you could argue that could be what Shireen will look like when she's older. But we have. Queen Selyse, and then we have Princess Shireen. And I believe in this timeline, Aegon and Shireen marry. That's how they unite their claims. Um, she's holding a dragon there. Um, and then we have Melisandre and Davos Seaworth. Um, and then a dragon in the back. Yeah, I'm not sure who that's meant to be exactly. But yeah, I should read this. Maybe I can do a video about it. But yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, but I don't think that marriage is happening. Yeah, yeah, that's clearly silly, so I don't know what I'm doing. Um, okay, now now we have the picture of Chad, Damon Blackfire, because as I was quickly crafting this, throwing this together, because I was late for the live stream, I clearly forgot to replace this one, but... Oh, well, we can just say that's Young Griff, right? Let's pretend this is Chad, Young Griff. Um, so these two theories, Young Griff will marry Marcella or Cersei, um... Why would he marry Mycella? Well, Dawn have hold of Mycella. Maybe he gets Dawn support and he marries her to, I don't know, create an alliance with House Lannister to get some legitimacy, right? He's like, oh, I've married a Baratheon daughter for anyone who supported Robert and the Baratheon dynasty. We're together, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you could also look at the, um, the prophecy that Maggie the Frog gave Cersei. Gold will be their crowns, gold will be their shrouds. Maybe that's how Marcella gets her gold crown, is by becoming queen. Um, although it might just be a metaphorical crown, because um, Ariane tried to name her queen, you know, following Dornish custom to stir up war, basically, between Dawn and the Iron Throne. Uh, or it could just be gold will be their crown, as in literally their heads, right? Joffrey, golden crown, like blonde hair. They'll have blonde, uh, golden shrouds and golden hair. Um, so... Uh, will he marry Vicella? No. No, probably not. Um, will he marry Cersei? This is one theory I've seen. <laughs> no, almost definitely not. I don't even know how to defend that one. I guess Cersei goes, fuck it, fuck all of you, I'm siding with Young Griff against you. But yeah, no, I think Aegon will topple Cersei. I don't think he <laughs> he's going to marry Cersei. Um, yeah. No, no milf hunting for for young Griff. See, this is a disturbing picture of Cersei, a fan art of Cersei in the Winter Winter screaming. The whole full picture is her with like Tommen's dead body. Uh, she should be up here actually, because this is about Cersei. But oh well, whatever. Um, I guess we'll do another vote then. Sansa, Shireen, Marcella, and Cersei. Let's do a vote. Um, who will young Griff? Marry. Another one. Um, Sansa. Shireen. Uh, Marcella or Cersei. And the poll is starting. Of course, if you don't agree with any of them, you don't have to vote. Or you could vote for what's most likely. Whoever wins this poll, I'm going to put up against Ariane Martel. And then we'll do like a final poll to determine... Um, looks like we have a super chat. <coughs> Thank you very much for the super chat from Boombler, who says, I just want to say, young Griff marrying Cersei would be hot AF. It is incredibly unlikely, which is a shame, but whatever. 
That would be <laughs> that would be based. Okay, well, Boombla needs to be hit with the horny stick. Um, young Griff marrying Cersei is like one hell of an idea. Just this like borderline insane <laughs> queen marrying this young man who's like, I'm overthrowing you, your ch your child. I'm overthrowing your child, Tommen, but marry me, please. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Um, imagine, like, the point of view of a Cersei chapter of her, like, marrying and bedding young Griff. That would just be weird. You'd just be like, I hate this boy. Um. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, Sansa's winning. Ooh, Sansa's winning by quite a lot, but we'll leave the poll up for a little bit, and then we'll do... The final will join the winners of both of them together, and yeah, right. Well, if you want to write that fan fiction, Boomblow, if you want to write um, Young Griff smashing Cersei, you're free to do that. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll review it one day. Okay, what's next? Um, yes. Oh yeah. So next up, friends in the Reach. So, um, in two different paragraphs, we have members of the Golden Company talking about Friends in the Reach. Now, they do also say uh, Friends in the Stormlands at one point and Friends in Dawn, um, but people tend to focus on the Reach bit. So, Friends in the Reach, we have two main contenders. So, well, actually, okay, let's go through them. So, first off, the Tyrells, no, because they actively say the Tyrell support isn't... Tyrell power isn't what Mace believes it to be, which implies very heavily um, the Tyrells aren't aware, right, that they're, they're not t allied with House Tyrell, they're tied in too deeply with uh, House Lannister. But who else in the Reach is powerful enough and relevant in the story to side with Aegon, in a way where it's not just like, House Beesbury is it, or something. Um, so the two options people talk about, which I, I mentioned in my last video, is House Math uh, sorry, Lord Mathis Rowan and Lord Randall Tarly. So to start off, uh, Mathis Rowan, we don't really know that much about him, except he's a very powerful lord. He's currently marching with Mace Tyrell to Storm's End, so the idea would be that he will betray Mace in some way, and that would help Young Griff win the Battle of Storm's End. So that's that's kind of the only reason. Um, with Randall Tarly, the idea would be... And there's two bits of evidence. One more obvious one is he's a Master of Laws on the Small Council currently, and he downplays the threat of Aegon. He goes, oh, who cares about this Aegon pretender? He's irrelevant. Uh, we don't have to, whatever. And it could be that he's lulling everyone into a full sense of security deliberately so that young Griff has an advantage. And then there's also the whole idea that I mentioned in my video about Brightwater Keep, that um, Brightwater Keep belongs to the Florence. Uh, they're all disowned, right? They're all dispossessed of it because they side with Stannis. But Randall Tarly's wife is a Florent, and she hasn't sided with Stannis. She's with Randall Tarly, and therefore s s supporting the crown. So you could argue Brightwater Keep should pass to her, and therefore Randall Tarly. But no, instead it passes to uh, Garland Tyrell, the second son of Lord Mace Tyrell. So Randall could be like, well, I want Brightwater Keep, so I'll side with you, um, young Griff. And in return, I want Brightwater Keep through my wife. I want that castle. Um... Or maybe he also wants to be Lord Paramount of the Reach, who knows. Maybe he could argue that through his wife as well. Maybe he could be like, listen, my wife is a Florent. The Florents have a better claim to High Garden than the Tyrells, technically. So through my wife, because all the other Florents are treacherous bastards siding with Stannis, through my wife, I want High Garden. And we could see Lord Paramount uh, Randall Tarly. So, Mathis Rowan and or Randall Tarly. Uh, friends in the Stormlands, I'm not entirely sure who could be loyal there um, but this very neatly leads us on to our next theory which is the Zuma invasion uh, before we jump into that I think I will close the poll because it looks like it's quite um, obvious who's won that being Sansa Stark winning with 53% uh, in second place claim going overhead in second place we have Marcella uh, in third place, we have Cersei with 14%, Maya Sella had 21 and Shireen is trailing with 12%. More more of you think young Griff will marry Cersei than Shireen? Actually, no, that no, Cersei is more likely. Just, just logistically, even if it's not likely at all. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'm ending that poll. <coughs> Excuse me. 
high towers. Yeah, that's the thing. High towers are so tied into the Ironborn plot, and you're on attacking Old Town and so on. And Mace's wife being a high tower. Yeah, I don't think the high towers are the friends in the reach. I think them being distracted, the the red wines and the high towers being distracted by the Ironborn, means that neither of them are probably pro young Griff. Right? They're probably distracted, and then maybe House Tarly, House Rowan, who have the full might. Uh, of their armies ready to fight can help young Griff, you know. Let's do another poll then uh, before we go on to Zuma invasion being, who will young Griff marry the finale? So, the winners were Ariane Martel and Sansa Stark. Let's see who wins then. Who will young Griff marry? Ariane Martel or Sansa Stark? Keyboard tapping ASMR. The poll has started, it is in the chat, and hello, hello, hello to Quinn the GM, who has entered the chat, hi Quinn, everyone go and subscribe to Quinn the GM, uh, let's be honest, you you are, no one's watching this who isn't subscribed to Quinn the GM, Quinn said, what if Euron is the friend in the reach, yo, imagine it's the Ironborn, the gold governor, like, we got friends in the reach, oh no, 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 we got friends raiding the reach right now, shit, young Griff marrying Asha Greyjoy, <gasps> yo, Huh? Maybe. Maybe, you don't know. Young Griff marrying Euron Glamoured as the Dusky Woman. Oh, I don't know. Give me wins. I want wins so badly. I keep going in and out of accepting we're not getting it to then really wanting it and hoping we will get it. It's an emotional roller coaster. Okay, let's go into the next uh, theory. The Zuma Invasion. Before we jump into that, I'm going to turn my mic off and have a quick cough. Give me a second. Thank you for your patience. Now we are going to look at the Zuma invasion, aka the White Boy Summer. So the theory here is that young Griff is taking all his young lads on holiday, and uh, Randall Tarly is the chaperone. So first off, we have young Griff himself, who's what 18 years old. We determined last time he's a young young lad, and he will bring other young lads with him. So first off, Edric Storm, the bastard son of. Um, Robert Baratheon and a Florent, Delena Florent maybe, who um, Robert acknowledged as his bastard. Um, Stannis Baratheon tried to sacrifice him because he had king's blood, but Davos Seaworth and some of his allies rescued him and sent him uh, to the free city of Lys to be safe from Stannis and Melisandre and so on. The idea here is that the Golden Company found him, you know, Varys, through his spy network, found him. They have access to him. They're going to come back to Storm's End and say, look, we have Edric Baratheon. That's right, not Edric Storm. I legitimise him. He is Lord Edric Baratheon, and he can take Storm's End. And maybe that's, that will help him uh, take Storm's End, or it will be a sign of legitimacy. Look, look who I have on my side. I've got Edric, uh, Edric Storm. I have Edric Baratheon. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm building up a relationship with the, uh, with the Baratheons, the new house Baratheon. I'm making contacts, making waves you got to respect me. And then he'll also bring along Tyrek Lannister. Because remember, that's the son of Tyget Lannister. So one of the nephews of um, Tywin, one of the cousins of Tyrion, Jaime, Cersei, etc. He's not next in line to Castle Rock, but it could be. They bring out Tyrek and they're like, here's another young handsome lad. He's the new lord of Castle Rock. I've got a Baratheon ally and I've got a Lannister ally. And I'm going to put them in charge of Storm's End and Castle Rock, respectively. And Tyrek... Uh, disappears during the ride of King's Landing in the second book, and then in the in the fourth book, Jamie um, thinks about how that riot took place and that Varys conveniently wasn't there. Maybe he triggered the riot and snatched Tyrek. Who knows? And if he did, oh, excuse me, if he did snatch Tyrek, maybe because he's saving him as a puppet. So we have Edric Baratheon and Tyrek Lannister, a couple of young Zuma puppets who are going to charge in supporting Aegon and just giving him some more legitimacy and being put in, in charge of the you know these castles. And then in, on top of that, you could say maybe Harold Harding uh, supports, ends up supporting young Griff. He's a young lad as well. White Boy Summer continues. Um, Rickon Stark in the north. 
who knows uh then of course you know who's going to take over the reach who's going to be the lord paramount could it be one of the friends of the reach who helps them such as the uh the rowans or the tarleys or um so someone mentioned the merryweathers in the chat could be the merryweathers who knows that'll be their chaperone um what did i say in the in the discord earlier i was like uh or in waters will come along as like the the moody older brother <laughs> coming on holiday and slipping off to the club by himself but yeah that's the idea zuma invasion tyrek edric storm aegon all these young lads uh robert aaron or harold harding in the veil is just gonna be young people ruling throughout uh the seven kingdoms because all the parents are dying off so maybe maybe that's kind of a fun idea. Now, before I talked about... So, uh, Tyrek could be, like, a puppet Lord Paramount. Before, I've, I've talked about this theory quite a, <laughs> quite a lot, actually. Um, but b- before I've talked about Edric Storm, slash Edric Baratheon being Lord Paramount of the Stormlands, but some people have said, well, surely John Connington is more likely to be Lord Paramount of the Stormlands, because he's going to be reinstated as Lord of Griffin's Roost, but, you know, he's a key player behind this restoration surely he's going to be rewarded with a lord paramount seat yeah maybe um, maybe maybe okay and yes yeah all reign of griftmark um yeah okay um i'll do a couple more couple more polls before we move on and i'm sure the polls are fun live i hope they're also fun for people who aren't watching live, I don't know. I know there's a live chat replay. I don't know if you also get to see the polls in the live chat replay, but um, let's have a look. Oh, 70 votes are in. Who will young Griff marry? It's been six minutes. I think I'll wrap up the poll. Ariane Martel is willing by 71%. Sans Stark by 30%. Okay, it looks like most people agree with me then. We will talk more about Orain Waters a bit later, by the way. Don't worry. Don't worry. We'll talk, we'll talk more about... The Bastard of Griftmark. The Sigma of Westeros. Check out my old video, The Sigma of Westeros. That's a classic. Um, um, yes, okay, so the next poll can be Who are the friends in the Reach? Let me know. Who are the friends in the Reach? Who's more likely for you? So I will add the old oh, Tyrell. Um, <coughs> I see, yeah, the. No, the Tyros are like pretty much guaranteed to be no. no. Oh, I had the High Towers. High Tower, um, Rowan, Tarly, and Merryweather, which I didn't mention before. So Merryweather's yeah. We've got Orton Merryweather. We got Tana Merryweather, who are working for Cersei, but they're also probably spies. Blah blah blah. So the poll has started. Check it out in the chat. Do we need a poll for Zoomer Invasion? I think that one would just be. Do you agree? I don't think that one's as exciting. So let's move on to the next theory. Um, Dark Kingsguard and here we have anime Darkstar so the idea here is that you can probably hear a dog barking in the background that's the neighbour's dog um, excuse the coughing excuse the, the, the dog excuse the lateness it's just chaos um, so the idea here is that Aegon's Kingsguard will kind of be like a, a dark like a black mirror to his f- alleged father's Kingsguard to Rhaegar's Kingsguard Excuse me. So, to start off with, in Rhaegar's Kingsguard, we had Lord Commander Gerald Hightower, um, you know, a powerful noble from the Reach, who is um, going to be the Lord Commander of Young Griff's Kingsguard. Well, presumably his first ever Kingsguard, Sir Rowley Duckfield, who is now wearing a snowy white cloak. And John Connington wasn't happy with that, but nonetheless, he named Rowley Duckfield as his uh, first Kingsguard member. So we have a Reach noble in the form of Gerald Hightower being contrasted or paralleled here with a Reach peasant because Rowley Duckfield was the son of a blacksmith in the Reach who broke the legs of Lord Caswell's son and and fled Westeros to avoid punishment and joined the Golden Company. Um, Who else did we have on Rhaegar's Kingsguard? We had Sir Barristan Selmy, Barristan the Bold, and there's a theory that Barristan Selmy will return to that Kingsguard, right? That, um, so... There's a theory that he will abandon Daenerys uh, and join young Griff. And so the parallel there will be, of course, you have young 
um, brave Barrist and Selmy, and now we have kind of old, slightly more depressed Barrist and Selmy. Uh, it's also noted that Varys pushes for the idea of um, Barrist and Selmy being kicked out the king guard, um, kicked out the king's guard, and blamed for King Robert's death. And this is in the first book, I think. So this is probably when originally Varys and Illyria were going to be just pro Targaryen anyway. So the plan was probably get Barristan on Daenerys' side but then that changed up and they're not necessarily pro-Daenerys so maybe their plan was Barristan will flee and join young Griff but it didn't work out I don't know but the theory is that Barry Barry B himself, uh, Barry S sorry Barry Barry the B Barry the Bold um, will side with young Griff now who else was on Rhaegar's Kingsguard Sir Arthur Dane of course the Sword of the Morning the epitome of chivalry the Lancelot of A Song of Ice and Fire I think you know where this is going. Um, his dark mirror will be literally his dark cousin, Darkstar, that guy. Um, yeah, so Gerald Dane uh, says his cousin's a sword of the morning. He infamously says, but I'm of the night. And um, he currently wields Dawn. The um, No, he doesn't. Does he wield Dawn? No, he doesn't. But the idea is that he will join young Griff, and so he will be on the Kingsguard, and he'll be the kind of dark, edgy... Um, uh, you know, counterpart to what uh, Gerald, uh, to what Sir Arthur represented. So, what have we got so far? We've got Gerald Hightower being contrasted with Rowley Duckfield, noble versus peasant. We've got young Barristan being contrasted with old, cynical Barristan. We have um, wholesome Arthur Dane being contrasted with edgy anime villain. So, Gerald Dane, uh, in the old King's Guard, we had under Rhaegar, we had Sir John Thor Darry, who died at the Battle of the Trident. Well, we know now there's a bit of a succession dispute going on with Castle Darry and House Darry, but we know that the only, the only male Darry left alive is a, a Darry, an unnamed Darry bastard cousin. Well, the Darrys are famously, very pro Targaryen, so perhaps, this Darry bastard will, um, join Young Griff's side and be on his Kingsguard. A good place for bastards. Who else was on Rhaegar's Kingsguard? Prince Lewin Martell. The uncle of Duran and Oberyn Martell, who was um, slain by Selyn Corbray in the Battle of the Trident. Well, do we have any um, Dornishmen who could join the King's Guard? Perhaps Damon Sand, the handsome Damon Sand, a um, the bastard son of Lord Illyrian, a friends slash friend slash lover of Ariane Martell, currently with her uh, to meet Young Griff. Maybe when Dawn sides with Young Griff, which inevitably I think they will. Um, as a show of goodwill, he will join Young Griff's Kingsguard, and he will be the Dornish equivalent there. But again, instead of a Martell prince, it's a bastard. So, the, what's the point of this? I guess the idea is you have the perfect Prince Rhaegar. I'm saying Rhaegar's Kingsguard, it's Ares's Kingsguard, but y you know what I mean. You have the perfect Rhaegar, you have the Kingsguard, all these brave noblemen, and then the... Uh, the, the parallel of this new fake Targaryen will be old men, bastards, peasants, and um, edgy anime villains. I think that's kind of, yeah, that could be fun. I don't know if that's intentional, but it, it's a fun idea, and there's probably a load of other suggestions that I haven't come up with that um, feel free to throw those at me, because that could be quite fun. Um, how's the poll doing? Looks like Tali is winning, yeah. Yeah, with nearly 60 votes in, we've got 41% of people voting Tali as the Friends in the Reach. In second place, we have Hightower. Oh, interesting, Hightower is higher than Rowan and Merriweather. We have Hightower on 32%, and then we have House Rowan and House Merriweather tying at 14%, probably because they're not as popular or well-known as houses. But we'll end the poll there. Upara San joining the Kingsguard, maybe, but I kind of like the idea of Brienne being the first female member of the Kingsguard. Young Griff's Kingsguard is going to be a bunch of young men with no honor or prestige, just naming High Lords. Yes, that's something. John, that's why John Connington is annoyed that Young Griff names Rowley Duckfield to the Kingsguard because he's like, well, he's just some guy, he's just some protector, he's just some knight, and he's like, yeah, well, he'll die for me, and it's like, yeah, that's not the point. We need to get lords on our side. 
right? It's a great honor to join the King's Guard. Leave the spaces open, and we can be like, you side with me, your son, your brother, your cousin, you can join the King's Guard and go down in history. Yeah, hot de recency. With regards to the High Tower vote. Um, yeah. <coughs> I won't do a poll for that because that would just be like a do you agree yes or no and not super interesting. So let's move. We've gone far, far beyond the bottom of the iceberg into the dark depths of the ocean. So where we go next? Oh, Next up we have Aegon's Conquest 2 and Dance of the Dragons 2. So let's see what, let's break down what that means. So first off, the idea that... Um, Aegon the Sixth's conquest will be a parallel of Aegon the First's conquest. So what do we have? Initially we have Aegon Targaryen, right? Aegon the Conqueror comes to invade. And then we have a kind of reversal of that. We have Aegon the Sixth coming to conquer. Except um, he may be a blackfire. Now who else did Aegon Targaryen have on his side? He had Oris Baratheon. And Going back to that Zuma theory, who does Young Griff have? Edric Storm, a Brathian bastard. And Oris Brathian himself was a, a bastard. He was the bastard half-brother of Aegon the Conqueror. But you sort of have Young Griff as descended from the Blackfire bastard line. Then you have Edric Storm, who's a bastard. And who, who else sided with Aegon the Conqueror? Daemon Valarian. And who might side with Young Griff? Another bastard, kind of fitting into that... This is like literally the bastardized version of Aegon's Conquest. Um, Orain Waters, the bastard of Driftmark, filling in that Daemon Valarian role. So let me take this opportunity to talk about Orain Waters because I haven't really brought him up yet. Well, I did earlier, but I didn't go into it enough. So Orain Waters, he's the bastard of Driftmark. Initially, he sides with Stannis because House Valarian sides with Stannis, but then Orain, uh, not Orain, sorry. Um, Monford Valarian blows up uh, on the Pride of Driftmark during the Battle of the Blackwater, and Orin Waters is sent where well, he's captured, and then he bends the knee, and he stays at court. Um, and Cersei has a crush on him, because he's like, oh, he kind of looks like Rhaegar, so Cersei names him Master of Ships. And as Master of Ships on the small council, he uh, constructs massive war drummons, and he, instead of getting seasoned captains and so on, he just gets, like just like his mates and then like criminals and thieves and so on and so he just ends up having a fleet of criminals and then when Cersei is arrested he just flees oh you could argue it's one of the least realistic parts of Feast for Crows that he's allowed to get away with that but it is indicative of the corruption and incompetence of the Cersei regime um but yeah Orain Waters flees and then later there are rumors of a pirate king who's established himself in the stepstone who's raiding everyone people suspect that Orain Waters um, oh, he's calling himself Lord of the Waters, so it's like, okay, Lord of the Waters, he is a Waters, the Vlarin Lords call themselves Lord of the Tides, yeah, it's probably Orin Waters, who's a pirate king with his criminals and his fleet. Well, maybe he will help young Griff, maybe they'll have a deal, look, hey, we need a bigger fleet, we need more men, how about you side with me, you be my admiral, and you sort out fleets and stuff. Um, yeah, and then maybe he'll become master of ships and he'll fulfill that Daemon Valarian role. And again, it plays into the whole Zuma invasion. We have the young bastard. Um, it sort of plays into the whole idea of young Griff being surrounded by, you know, young men and bastards and peasants and exiles. And he's, he's sort of a, just ragtag misfits, you know. Uh, but that's a fun idea. What isn't so much of a fun idea is the Dance of the Dragons 2. The idea that in the past we have the Dance of the Dragons um, and we have the Blackfire Rebellion as well. What if we merge them together and we have the Blackfire Rebellion, th this being the sixth Blackfire Rebellion, and then it becomes the second Dance of the Dragons because a Targaryen fights against another Targaryen, but maybe it's actually a Blackfire, but that's irrelevant. I think there will be some kind of dragon fight going on. I think it's set up, it's foreshadowed. I don't think it's just going to be Daenerys like burning King's Landing with Aegon in it, I think Aegon will be riding a dragon. Um, I think somehow um, Young Griff will... Well, I say somehow, Young Griff will claim a dragon for himself 
it's because he has Targaryen blood. Whether he's a son of Rhaegar or whether he's from the Blackfire line, he still has Targaryen blood. The dragon, you know, riding is weird. It's mysterious. It's some. It works for some people. Doesn't work for others. But let's say we have Young Griff claims a dragon. We have Daenerys and Young Griff battling it out on Dragonback. Dance the dragons too. I think. I mean, the books literally called a dance of uh, the, a dance with dragons, right? And originally that book was meant to encompass a lot more than it originally did because we don't really have a dance of dragons i think that title was originally going to be i mean for i think his original outline was that the second book in the series would be a dance with dragons and it was meant to be um daenerys invading westeros so like dragons coming over and actually doing shit right and i imagine that would have been repurposed into dragons fighting dragons but now it just that just became the name of the book that we have which is half a book even though it's super long and it doesn't even have a proper conclusion so that's all kind of a mess really but maybe young griff will take a dragon but who will he take well daenerys rides drogon so that leaves Viserion and Rhaegal. i think it makes the most sense for him to take Rhaegal because of the three dragons i believe Rhaegal is the one who is the most feisty and mm, um most rebellious the rebellious teenager but also he's named after Rhaegar, so Young Griff claims to be Rhaegar's son. I could see him taking Rhaegar. I don't know when he would do that. Like, what situation would would arise where he'd claim a dragon? But I can see that happening. I can see there being a dance to the dragons, whether uh, Daenerys and Young Griff, high up in the sky, riding dragons, facing each other. Uh, maybe it's revealed he's a Blackfire. Maybe Daenerys snaps. I don't know. Um, but let's see what you see. I haven't, I haven't checked the chat in a while. What do you think? <clears throat> Young Griff has no dragons, and the Golden Company only has ten thousand men. Um, even with elephants, what are the chance of the, their success? Well, they they don't have any success unless they have allies in Westeros. And I think the idea is that Dawn, which is pretty much untouched by the War of the Five Kings, will side with Young Griff and turn the tide, as well as you know allies in the region of Stormlands and and the Riverlands and the Vale of the North being tied up in their own thing. If <laughs> George can't write all of this in one book, um. I kind of wish he would just announce eight books, you know, because he said before that seven, because originally it was going to be a trilogy, then it was going to be five, then it became seven, and he was like, oh, there's poetry to that, because it's seven kingdoms, seven gods, seven Kingsguard members, faith is seven, blah, blah, blah. Seven is a nice number, and it's a running theme in the books. It's not a running theme, it's a running numbers in the books, and he's like, well, seven books, that makes sense. Seven kingdoms, seven books, it's like, okay, yeah, that's cool, but... <laughs> You, that's not a great way to decide how many books you should have just because it sounds nice. Like, if you need eight books, do eight books. I would rather he he was like, okay, I'm going to do eight books and I'm going to wrap up Windsor Winds faster, a Windsor Winter faster, and then conclude in the next two books. Because I think he just doesn't know how to tie everything together. And he wouldn't have to tie everything together if he hadn't made it so complicated, you know? If he hadn't... There are so many plot lines and threads and characters, and it's just like, whoa, whoa, slow down. You don't need all of this. We don't need, like, ten Ironborn POVs. We don't need, like, three Dawn POVs. Like, slow down, boy. But the thing is, when you achieve a certain level of success, you have more yes-men around you. You have, you don't have to listen to the naysayers anymore. And when he, when he wrote Feast and Dance, at that point, yeah, sure, no HBO series. Actually, HBO series, while he was writing dance was in development but he was doing you know he was uh, hitting the times bestseller lists, lists he was doing well for himself financially he reached the point where he could say he could say no right the same thing happened to jk rowling it's like why the um what's the fifth one order of the phoenix is so big and arguably bloated to many people is because she'd reached a level of fame where she could just say no to her editor and that's the issue when you're an author and you get a sudden level of fame and money and ego you could you you don't have to listen to the editor. You can be like, no. No. I mean, if you 
you know, I could just take this to another editor if you want. Don't argue with me. I'm going to do it my way. But the thing is, editors are there for a reason. You need people to rein you back and to tell you what to add and what not, what not to add. Um, yeah. That's just how it happens, you know. I can see why George wouldn't want to announce a new book without having released another book. Yeah, that's true. I think if he's going <laughs> to... If that is true. If he's going to... Maybe he'll finish wins and then be like, I finished wins, everyone. Um, I'm going to work on Dream of Spring, and actually there's going to be another book. <laughs> there's going to be an eighth one. I'll be fine with that, honestly. He feels like, I'll be like, yeah, sure. The more complex, the better, someone says. I mean, I would agree with that if the series were finished, you know? <laughs> I'd be if if they were satisfyingly tied together, but it's like, yeah, complex isn't inherently good. It's just if if you handle it right, like something a super simple fantasy story can be just as good as a super complex fantasy story if it's handled well. And so far, I think it's been the complexity has been handled well, but it's how will it go into the future? How will it wrap up? And I also don't think it's fully been handled well. I think there's lots of like bloat and filler and just like unnecessary stuff in the last two books. As much as I enjoy Feast and Dance, it's like, there's so many chapters where you're just like, this doesn't need to be here. Why did you need, why did you feel the need to add this? Um, like, the entire Quentin plot uh, is arguably pointless. Like, you don't need the Quentin plot. You really don't. But that's maybe for another time. Um, let's move on, shall we? The final theory of the very dark depths of the ocean, the very bottom, on the seabed, where stingrays and shit are floating about, I don't know. Anyway, the bells. What does this kind of do with young Griff? Well, the idea here is that, um, King's Land, this is more of a John Connington theory than a young Griff theory, but the idea is that John Connington will violently sack King's Landing, and maybe destroy King's Landing in some way. Um, so I have a picture of Daenerys here, because obviously... In the show, episode 5, the infamous episode, is called The Bells. And the bells ring for surrender, and Daenerys gets triggered and then blows everything up for reasons we still don't really know why. And the idea is that in the books, that sounds kind of similar to John Connington. He fought at the Battle of the Bells during Robert's Rebellion, um, and he's sort of traumatised because uh, he lost that battle badly, and he ended up being uh, kicked out of his position of Hand of the King and exiled, and nearly drank himself to death and so on. <coughs> and so those bells trigger him because, like, they represent, they remind him of that epic failure, all the men that died. His, his, you know, he's like, if I had won that battle, we may not, Rhaegar may not have died at the Trident, the Targaryens, sorry, the Targaryens may not have been overthrown, etc. And so people suspect, okay, where did D&D &D get the idea for the bells of King's Landing ringing and then someone going crazy and destroying it? Is it anything to do with John Con, who we know is triggered by bells because of that experience? Are we going to have it so that young Griffin company, they build up alliances, they build up support, everything's going perfectly for them, they reach King's Landing, then the bells ring for whatever reason, maybe surrender, maybe whatever, and then John Con goes nuts and destroys King's Landing in some way, violently sacks it. Um... In the same way that Elia Martel's children were killed, maybe Tommen is violently killed. I don't know. Maybe it's a repeat of, you know, Tywin Sack. Um, maybe. I don't know about this one. Like, there has to be... It's too much of a coincidence that you have an episode called The Bells, and they talk so much about the bells being surran meaning surrender and an error, blah, blah, blah. It's too much of a coincidence that we have all that, and we also have a character who fought at the Battle of the Bells, who's triggered by bells, and so on. Like, it's too... It's too coincidental, but what would what would the purpose be? I think Young Griff needs to be successful. Young Griff needs to be successful. He needs to overthrow Cersei and sit the Iron Throne. Then we will have the Daenerys versus Aegon conquest. Maybe that um, conflict. Sorry, maybe that happens before the Long Night. Maybe it happens after the the Long Night. Right, but I I think if he reaches King's Landing and then they fuck everything up. Then it's like, but then we don't have that. We don't have that like perfect handsome king swooping in and stealing the thunder from Daenerys because we because he would 
if he sacked King's Landing for no reason. If John Con did, then that kind of fucks things up. I don't know. This is... If I'm not making sense, it's because I haven't... I, I missed a chunk out of uh, this bit. Talking about Dance of the Dragons 2, there was more I wanted to say that I forgot to say. So let me explain. I've talked about this in my previous stream... In my Dark Theory streams, I think. I've talked about the idea of... Um, Young Griff, although I said, yeah, it's kind of a bunch of misfits and bastards and so on, that ultimately what they represent to the people of Westeros is hope. They represent hope, they represent goodness. You have Handsome King, maybe he's going to marry his beautiful Dornish queen. Um, they're going to swoop in with their golden warriors and they're going to restore uh, the Targaryen name and all his allies are going to be young, handsome men and it's all going to be perfect. He's the perfect king. Um, and he's coming in after all this incompetence and chaos and bloodshed and disease and famine and radicalism and he's going to come in and save the day and everyone will love him and that will be a further wedge between him and Daenerys because then Daenerys will come and she will look like a villain right from the perspective of the people in Westeros young Griff is the good guy his supporters are the good guy overthrowing Mad Queen Cersei and so on and not only that but he almost represents I've talked about this before he represents um, the natural continuation of history, right? Like War of the Roses, Chaos, Bloodshed, but then you have Owen Tudor, uh, no, sorry, Owen Tudor's son, you have Henry Tudor, Henry the Seventh, coming in, uniting the houses, and restoring peace and order, etc. And that is young Griff coming in, uniting things, re restoring peace of order, peace and order. And then you have Daenerys and her gang representing the unnatural continuation of, of history, like the wedge uh, in the gears, like ru like ruining it. Right, young Griff comes in, saves the day, but then you have Daenerys who fucks things up. And then this changes the status quo and would lead to something like Bran Stark becoming king, where the cycle breaks and we have the like omnipotent tree god in charge. I don't know, that that's that that's something else. We won't go into that today. But look at Daener look at Daenerys from the perspective of the small folk. So perfect young Griff, handsome, beautiful queen, golden army. Saving the day, restoring order, toppling the corruption and incompetence of the Lannisters, etc. And then you have Daenerys. She's an evil queen from abroad with three dragons. It's said that she bathes in the blood of virgins. It's said that she she's crucified slave owners. It says that she's burned people alive. She burns children to feed her dragons. Who else has she got on her side? Well, she has an army of eunuch slaves doing her bidding. She has vicious sellswords. She has savage rapists called Dothraki. And to make matters worse, who's that on her shoulder, dripping poison into her ear, but the evil villainous kin-slaying and king-slaying dwarf Tyrion Lannister? Like, probably as her hand, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's like a villain origin story, right? When you view it from the outside, Sir, um, Daenerys' rise to power coming with her, you know, her sigil is red and black. Her words are fire and blood. She rides dragons. She has um, Mongols and and slaves and sell swords and an evil dwarf. And it's like, she's the villain, right? She's the villain of the story. That's what it looks like. And then Young Griff's the good guy. And that will be part of the conflict. That it will be what the average commoner sees is good versus bad. Mad Queen Daenerys versus Young Griff. And then, again, that could be exacerbated by um, him being a blackfire him not marrying her, her being locked out of power. Maybe this conflict happens after the Long Night, right? So in the show, when you have the conflict continues against Cersei and all the viewers were like, wait, what's going on? This is this is out of order. Maybe um, Jon Snow, Daenerys, etc., they deal with the Long Night. All of it takes place in the North, but in the South, they act like it's not real. In the South, they're like, oh no, it was just a blizzard or whatever. And everyone loves young Griff. And Daenerys is like, I literally saved, I sacrificed so much to save the entire kingdom and you're rallying behind this perfect prince, young Griff. And then that could lead to whatever drastic action Daenerys takes, whether it's Mad Queen or, or whatever. Second Dance of the Dragons, yeah. But with that in mind, linking it back to the Bells, with that in mind, John Con being the one to destroy King's Landing and go crazy and so on doesn't seem to fit that. So I'm not entirely sure. But, yeah. Let me know what you think. I'm curious. I went on a big ramble. I really want to know what you guys think. <coughs> let me know. Let me know. 121 watching, but only 57 likes, says Harwin Wenton in the chat. That's a very good point. 
let's get those numbers up. If you're watching this video, give it a cheeky like um, if you want. You don't have to, but if you do, it really helps the uh, the channel grow and all that stuff. Okay, I'm going to breeze over the chat, I think. Again, um, before we wrap up the live stream, feel free to send in any super chats if you want me to answer your questions or just say something dumb or whatever. It does it does help the channel a lot. And as always, I'll throw it in. Uh, check out the Patreon to support Fantasy Haven. We've got all sorts of goodies, right? Exclusive videos like Animated House Dane. You get to join the Discord at any tier. You get special updates and teasers, uh, wallpapers. I draw art for you. I cameo your art in a video, shout your name out, all that good stuff. I'm confident in saying I provide more than the average YouTuber on Patreon, right? Most YouTubers are like, I will say your name at the end. And it's like, oh, I do more than that, way more than that. And for those harassing me about merchandise, it's coming. I promise you, November this month, I will try and find time to sort out merchandise. Maybe when I finish this upcoming video, <laughs> in time for Christmas, Fantasy Haven merch. If you want some big-eyed creatures on your mug or your t-shirt, <laughs> go ahead. Um. Hmm. Uh. Yeah. How is Aegon going to take a dragon? Well, he's got... He has Targaryen blood, even if he's a backfire. And these things are kind of random. Like, someone might have a drop of blood and they can take it. A dragon and some people might have... Can't, I don't know. It's kind of messy. They look at a dragon seed, right? It's, in terms of claiming a dragon, it's, it's messy. Yeah, George loves world building, um, which I think is why he enjoys stuff like Fire and Blood so much, because it's just pure world building and he hasn't got to worry about POV chapters. Scouring of the Shire moment for A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, John defeats the others, but young Griff slash Daenerys slash Cersei slash Huron have developed, have, de have developed firearms. Wait, what the fuck? Green because it's using wildfire. Oh. Like guns, like flamethrowers. What? <laughs> what? Um, yeah, I think there has to be because he's talked about how he loves the Lord of the Rings ending, the bittersweet and all that stuff. So that that bittersweetness, is that a word bittersweetness? Um, yeah, I can see there being the dramatic ending and then a scouring of the shy moment, and I, you know, the scouring of the shy moment in the show being. Continuing the conflict against Cersei was just really dumb, but in the books, maybe it will be wrapping up whatever the hell is going on with Young Griff or Euron or whatever. Hmm, someone says it's going to be Jon Con who goes mad and burns King's Landing, probably after Aegon and Arion die and his cause fails. Ah, okay. Maybe. Oh, Callum said, I think Quentin's story was put into a song by Ice and Fire because it was a story Gurn wanted to tell but had nowhere to put it. I agree with that. I think I think he came up with the idea of subverting the, you know, um, the D&D &D party, the ugly prince, blah, 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 that kind of storyline where he was like, they, all the young, the young friend and his... The young man and his friends all go on an adventure like Harry Potter or, um, what's it called, Percy Jackson or whatever, except it all goes to shit. Some of them get die of disease, they get killed by pirates, and then he gets there and he gets rejected by the beautiful prince and he tries to tame a dragon and then he dies. And it's like, yeah, he wanted this sort of cynical, dark, subversive side plot, but like, it didn't, he didn't need it. We didn't need to spend so much time and effort in, in that, in making that work. It didn't need to be there. Brienne is different. I think Brienne's, yeah, Brienne's going somewhere. Um, that's my hot take. I've got many hot takes. I've got my hot take about 
Rickon, when everyone's like, oh, Rickon is actually uh, just going to die in the end. And you know why? It's because his wolf is a shaggy, is called Shaggy Dog. And it's a Shaggy Dog story, and it's a smart literary reference. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. It's, no. <laughs> if, if, he, if he's pointless and the justification for wasting time with Rickon in any capacity is that his dog is the name of a literary device, then that's utter bullshit. No, I'm not, I'm not going to accept that. <clears throat> Daenerys is Sauron, but we've seen her backstory. Um, I don't agree with that. I don't think... Hmm. I, I do really like the idea of a villain origin story, but we, like, see it from the start, and we get to know them, and we assume they're a good guy, that they're a protagonist, and as it goes on, we're like, oh, shit. I don't... I think that's why Tyrion's going. Maybe Daenerys is going there, too. I don't know. I don't. I don't think Daenerys is is going down that route. Exactly. I don't think it's going to be as blatant as the show, where she just suddenly goes crazy. Um, Daenerys. Uh, Boomla said Daenerys and Young Griff are the two fantasy tropes of exile. The exiled royal, a perfect prince who casts down the tyrant to Young Griff, and the evil tyrant princess coming back to reclaim her throne. Yes, I. I think I kind of agree with that. Oh yeah, and on yeah, so I made a good point. On top of all of the potential um, tension between Daenerys and Griff is also the fact that I didn't mention, which is one of the most obvious, that she's a woman, and a woman has not sat on the Iron Throne since um, Rhaenyra, and she's considered to be like a shit queen, and all that was a chaos and bloodshed and everything. Every Frey explained when. I don't know at this point. Uh, that's my Winds of Winter. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. When Windsor Winter comes out, that's when every Frey explained is coming out. I genuinely don't. If if George was suddenly like, Windsor Winter is releasing, in a few months, I wouldn't know what to do. I would be like, I just sit there like, huh, what, huh, <laughs> like what? What kind of videos do I make? <laughs> what, what do I say? What like ah. And when it finally released, I'd have to lock myself away and just read it. Like, don't look online, don't make any videos until the whole book is finished. And I'm a slow reader anyway, so I'm just going to be sad. I'm going to be like, ugh. There's got to be something hidden in Quentin's plotline. I don't think so. As someone mentioned before, he pissed over the uh, fancy young adventurers trope. I think that's what he was doing. He just wanted to do that, and he was like, where can I fit that? And then he made a story out of it, but it's like, you didn't need that story there, those two. Yeah. Danny's madness went from 10 to 100 in the course of one episode. Yeah. I don't think Danny will go mad. I think the idea is that she's going to become more ruthless. I can see her fulfilling the role of a villain, but not actually being a villain, if you know what I mean. Like, it will be kind of villain origin story, but it'll be more like... Like a messiah complex, it'll be more like I'm. I have to commit. I have to be ruthless and perhaps murderous for the greater good. I'm doing it for the greater good. I'm doing it. Um, I'm doing the right thing, and you know, I'm a. I'm a martyr. I'm a messiah. Blah. Uh, you know, maybe. And maybe she'll be a bit unhinged, but I don't. I don't know. I. I don't know. The fact I the the show has come and gone, and I still don't really know where the characters are going or where the story's going is is actually really cool. It's like, hell yeah. It's been it's been this long and yet I still don't really know what's gonna happen. <laughs> it's I, Callum said it's ironic for Gurm to say young adventurers are stupid when he has fourteen year old Jon Snow, thirteen year old Daenerys, sixteen year old Young Griff, yeah. He, Quentin's older than all of them, ironically. Tyrion also doesn't fit into the villain origin story because he's still complex. But that's the thing. I think his villains, not villains like Euron, but villains that are protagonists, vi villains that we're seeing through their eyes, they're not just going to be generic bad guys, right? They are going to be, we because we're in their head, they are super complex and interesting. Like, I think Tyrion will go down, continue to go down a villain route, but it won't be like, 
oh, I'm reading the bad guys chapter. It would be like, I'm reading the chapter of a protagonist who I like reading about, but they're still like not a great person. <laughs> Adventurers are okay only if literal children do it, not young adults like Quentin. Grow up. <laughs> Grow up, Harry Potter fans. Hmm, I'm just checking the chat at this point. I might wrap up soon, but I'm, I'm having fun. We should do this more often. <laughs> I should have more consistent streaming days. Um, I do want to do that live stream that's uh, assigning real-life crimes to a Song of Ice and Fire characters. That could be fun. I might do that with Quinn and GM, because I think as fun as these live streams are, I think, they're, just, they're nowhere near as fun by myself. Like, compared to, like, interacting with Quinn... Like, live streams with at least two people are more, always more fun than one guy rambling, so... I want to save all my good ideas and do them with Quinn, I think. People talk about subversion in the chat. <coughs> I think... Gum falls into story tropes and he subverts story tropes he does both there's nothing inherently right or wrong with subverting or not subverting you know it's just something you can do i think he does he does subvert stuff and he doesn't subvert other stuff um and again his subversion is more trying to subvert tropes established by pale tolkien imitators but this is all like pre ninety stuff. People like he he he's writing from the context of the nineties. Um. Okay, yeah, I guess I guess I'll. I guess I'll wrap up. I think I'll wrap up. I haven't had dinner. It's nearly eight p.m. and I have not had dinner. My goodness. Okay, yep, I think I'll wrap up. Thank you so much for watching, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Uh, the next video will be this Friday, and it will be What If? What if the Blackfire Rebellion succeeded? So I'll be going through each Blackfire Rebellion and being like, okay, how could it have succeeded? What happens if it does succeed? How long does it stay successful? That kind of stuff, you know? Uh, and then after that, it will be every... I'll do another CK3 video, every fail house explained. Then after that, I don't know. There's lots of stuff I could do. Lots of houses I could talk about, lots of theories I could talk about, historical parallels, load of video ideas. And, like I said, I keep I want to branch beyond the Song of Ice and Fire as well, do some Witcher content. Um, Dune Part 2 is coming out next year, I need to start doing animated Dune content. Last Airbender live action series on Netflix, that looks pretty good. I'm thinking about doing some Avatar Last Airbender content. Um, I'm trying to work out how I draw Aang. Like, how do I draw the arrow on the forehead? Because my characters don't have foreheads, so I just have a big blue arrow over his eyes. <laughs> I have no idea. Either, either way, it'll be kind of fun. Um, yes, thank you for the stream. Thanks for coming along. Uh, okay. Yes, I must consume. I must eat. Goodbye. And, yeah. See ya.